and welcome back to another uh, Sunday School class. This is our, uh, our third week on uh, why we believe what we believe. And uh, we're going to look at the second of the five solas this morning, which is uh, sola Christus, or in Christ alone. And uh, when we talk about in Christ alone, what we're saying is that salvation is in Christ alone. The Bible says that uh, God created male and female. He created all of us uh, to be in perfect relationship with him. Uh, but all the way back in Genesis 3, not long after creation, uh, Adam and Eve sinned and, and they, um, they broke covenant with God and they became separated from God. And since then, uh, we read that in, in Romans 3.23, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So everyone since Adam and Eve uh, has, been, has been born into sin. And so because of this, because of sin, we are not in right relationship with God. We are separated from Him. Uh, we are broken. All of creation is broken uh, because of sin. And, uh, and there is only one person who can do anything about this. There's only one person who can save us uh, from our sin and from uh, eternal separation from God. And that person is Jesus Christ. The Bible says, uh, we're, we're going to be looking at three different uh, passages real quick. Acts 4 11 and 12 says this Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you the builders which has become the cornerstone and get this there is salvation in no one else for there is no other name under heaven by which you must be saved John 14 6 Jesus himself says I am the way the truth and the life no one comes to the Father except through me and then in Romans 10 9 we're told if you confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So salvation is in Christ alone. This is what the Bible teaches. There is no other way and there is no other Savior. But why is this true? Why do we believe this? Remember, this is the heart of our class is why do we believe what we believe? Well, the Bible teaches that Jesus is fully God and fully man. We read that he's fully God. He's the Son of God. He's the second person of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Uh, John 1, it starts off with saying that Jesus, who is the Word, uh, was with God. In fact, that he is God and that everything that has been made was made through Jesus. Uh, John 8, Jesus himself, when he's confronting the Pharisees, uh, he says to them, before Abraham was, I am. And of course, he's reminding us of, of Exodus 3, when God appears to Moses in the burning bush. And when Moses asks him, what's your name, God? Uh, God says, I am who I am. And so Jesus himself is using that name for God. He's, he's saying, I'm God. So he's fully God, but he's also fully man. Again, John 1, 14 uh, we read that the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. In Philippians 2, we read that uh, Jesus emptied himself and took on the form of a servant. He became a human being. Uh, and so he is, he is fully God. He's fully man. He is, look, this is important. He's not 50% God, 50% man. He's not half and half, not 50-50. And, and he doesn't, you know, just appear to be a man or, or just... You know, appear to be. He doesn't even. He doesn't even become God at some point in his life. He has always been God from the beginning, from from before the beginning, and he became man. And he's a hundred percent God, a hundred percent man. And he must be both. This is crucial to our understanding of how Jesus saves us. For more on this, we're going to look at something called the Heidelberg Catechism. This was written. Uh, in the mid 1500s, uh, mostly by a guy named Zacharias Ursinus uh, in Germany. And so this would have been about 40 years after uh, Luther's 95 Theses. And we're going to look at questions 16, 17, and 18 uh, to help us understand why only Jesus can be our Savior. So, question 16 is why must Jesus be a true and righteous man? And the answer is he must be a true man. Because the justice God requires that the same human nature which has sinned should pay for sin. 
He must be a righteous man because one who himself is a sinner cannot pay for others. In other words, um, if, you, if you and I tried to step up to the plate and be the, the ultimate sacrifice for all the sin uh, of humanity, um, we would fall short very quickly. <laughs> Only Jesus is qualified to do this. Uh, 1 Peter 3.18 says, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous. He took our place. He made an exchange with us. That, get this, he might bring us to God. That is, back into right relationship with God. Being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. So Jesus accomplished everything that we should have accomplished. Uh, In other words, he kept the law perfectly. And obviously, we don't do that. We can't do that. We are sinners uh, incapable of keeping the law. And so he is the only perfect human being, which means that he is the only possible perfect sacrifice for sin. He is the only spotless lamb uh, that can be offered up as a, as a replacement, as, a, um, as an atonement for our sin. All right, question 17. So this, this is going to be about how Jesus is God. Uh, it says, why must he at the same time be God? And the answer is, he must be true God, so that by the power of his divine nature, he might bear in his human nature the burden of God's wrath, and might abstain, ob- obtain for us and restore to us righteousness in life. So he, he's able to take on the wrath of God because he is God. No human, no mere human being could bear uh, the wrath of God. See, see, God has wrath uh, towards sin. He hates sin. Okay, it, it is what has broken creation. It is what has separated us from Him, uh, and and it is offensive to Him. And so He hates sin, and and He must punish it because God is just. He is perfectly just. If if He is not perfectly just, then then the universe is out of control, out of balance. It, it's God would cease to exist. He must be just towards sin. Uh, And so we can't take on God's wrath. We can't absorb that. We would be absolutely obliterated by it. Uh, Psalm 130 verse 3 says, If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? No one could stand except Jesus. This is why Jesus had to be God. In his humanity, he, he suffered And he died on the cross. And because he is divine, because he's God, he was able to take on the wrath of God due to us because of our sin. And then he was able to rise from the dead and rise victorious over sin and death. Only God could do that. And this is why we, you know, for salvation, we don't somehow earn it ourselves. We have to look to Jesus, trust in him, and, and get the righteousness that he alone offers to us in exchange for our sin. This is what 2 Corinthians 5.21 is saying. It says, For our sake uh, he made him to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. You see that exchange is happening. Okay, We are getting Jesus' perfect righteousness given to us. And, and Jesus got our sin put on him. And only he was able to make that happen. All right, so the final question, question 18. But who is that mediator who at the same time is true God and a true righteous man? We know the answer. Our Lord Jesus Christ, whom God made our wisdom, our righteousness, and sanctification and redemption. So Jesus is the mediator between man and God. He's able to be, you know, a representative of of God to us. So this is why, you know, we we don't need to go pray to a priest who who then prays to God for us. No, we can pray directly to Jesus Christ. He's our mediator. He's our great high priest. Uh, but he's also um, uh, God's representative to us. Okay? So if we trust him and if we repent of our sin, then we get everything he has. We get right relationship with God. We get new hearts and new life. We get forgiveness of sins. And one day we will get 
the kingdom of God in all its fullness when Jesus returns. So as we, uh, as we switch gears here a little bit, you know, there's so much more we can say about who Jesus is. Uh, we could literally stand here and talk for days about it, um, but we just don't have time. But I do, I do want to close with what I think is probably a pretty common objection uh, to this idea, this very exclusive idea uh, that, that it, salvation is in Christ alone. And, and that objection is the objection of pluralism. And this is the idea that there are many truths that, you know, some people will talk about it like this, that, um, you know, heaven or God is like a mountaintop. And uh, there are many different paths that lead up to the top of the mountain. And it doesn't matter which path you take as long as you take one of the paths. And in other words, all the different paths represent different religions. And uh, they're all ultimately leading to the same place. They just look different. Uh, on the journey. And, and so I wanted to talk about that for a little bit because basically what it's what it's saying is it doesn't matter if you're a Christian or a Hindu or a Muslim or a, um, a Buddhist or, or even an atheist, as long as you sincerely believe what you believe, uh, then you will get to heaven. And, and that's very problematic, uh, mostly because it doesn't hold up to the Bible. And, and as a side note, none of those other religions actually believe that. Muslims believe that, no, you have to keep the five pillars of Islam to, to have salvation. Uh, Buddhists believe, no, you have to follow the eightfold path of Buddhism. Um, atheists, which you may find it strange that I refer to that as a religion, but uh, it actually takes a quite a bit of faith to be an atheist. Um, atheists believe that there's no God and that there's no spiritual world at all. They're not even trying to get to heaven. They're just trying to live their best life now. Uh, so, but here's the difference. While, while all of those different religions, they do have an exclusive claim, all of their claims are, are very, very different from what the Bible claims uh, about how to find salvation. You see, they're all claiming, all those religions are claiming, hey, if you want to be saved, you've got to uh, either make some sort of sacrifice that, that God will, will be pleased with, or you've got to keep some sort of code or some sort of law uh, that will that will earn you know good points for yourself. Um, that's how you get to heaven. It's it's on you, all right. And what the Bible is teaching is that no, God Himself came down and became a human and and became the sacrifice on our behalf. Kept the law on our behalf so that we might be given salvation as a gift. That is completely different. You have two uh, contradictory truths right there. Uh, and, you know, two contradictory truths, no matter what a pluralist might tell you, they can't both be true. At least not in the realm of, of this sort of um, salvation. Uh, so, just as we close, I want, I want to give you three other things to think about here. Um, pluralism overestimates our abilities it underestimates sin, and it completely devalues Jesus Christ. Uh, it overestimates our abilities because it assumes that we are capable of making a right choice to walk up a mountain. In other words, we're, that we're capable of, of choosing uh, some right way to find salvation. And the Bible just says, says that that's just not true. The Bible not only says that we are incapable of choosing God or of choosing salvation, it actually says in Ephesians 2 that we are dead in our sins. And, and dead people do not make choices. Dead people only know how to do one thing. And of course, we're talking about spiritually dead people here. Spiritually dead people only know how to be spiritually dead. And this is why the Bible says that, that it's such good news that Jesus Christ made us alive. We didn't earn that or choose that or make a sacrifice to get that. We were simply made alive. We are passive in that. And that's good news because otherwise we are incapable of saving ourselves. And then we should not underestimate sin. You know, sin has permanently separated us from God. Sin is, is not just something that we can gloss over. Uh, in Luke 16, you, you read the story of the rich man and Lazarus, and it, it shows us how there is a great chasm between heaven 
uh, in between hell and that, and that no one can cross it. Uh, and, and it's a chasm it's, it's, that's really, truly, permanently separated us from God. This is a real thing. It's not just some myth or some theory. It's, we can't talk God out of this. We can't earn our way out of this. We can't prevent this. We can't satisfy this justice ourselves. We must have a mediator. We must have Jesus Christ to bridge that gap for us. And then finally, this devalues Jesus Christ. I mean, think about this. If there were many ways to find salvation, many truths, and it didn't really matter which one you picked, then why would Jesus bother emptying himself, leaving his place in heaven, taking on flesh, subjecting himself to temptation and to all of the different weird and and difficult things that humans go through? And then why would he bother letting people beat him and and put him on a cross and kill him. Why would he do any of that if it really wasn't necessary, if all we had to do was just pick something and believe it sincerely? He wouldn't. He absolutely would not do that. But he had to do that because it's the only way. Only a perfect man can be a perfect sacrifice or substitute for our sin. Only a perfect man can earn righteousness and give it to us as a gift. Think of the selflessness, the humility, Only a perfect man can then take our sin on himself and and defeat it. Only God can do that. Only God can satisfy the wrath of, of God and then rise victorious from the dead. This is the only way salvation can be accomplished. There is no other way. You know, I I feel like people want to believe that all truths are equally valid because people want to respect other beliefs, and we should respect other beliefs, and especially the people who hold them. Uh, but, but to really believe this actually devalues who Jesus is and what he has done. Uh, so, how do we find salvation? 1 John 5.12 says, Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. Uh, and salvation is found in no one else but Christ alone, and therefore he's our only hope in life and death.